Ooh, Ladies okay. and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Let us begin as always by reciting together the Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go, and you guys can do it too at this point because you've heard it enough <laughs> times. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. Friends, this is a day of constitutional consecration because we are met to present the proposals of the Constitution Center's virtual constitutional convention. Uh, this is a remarkable project with a result that surpassed all of our expectations. Last year, we convened three teams led by the three distinguished scholars uh, that you see here uh, with us um, to propose amendments to the Constitution. Team Conservative, led by Ilan Worman, Team Progressive, led by Carolyn Fredrickson, and Team Libertarian, led by Ilya Shapiro. And they met in a state of Zoom, and on their <laughs> own, they proposed a series of constitutional amendments, which you can see online. And we were struck in comparing the amendments uh, that some of them um, were the same. And in fact, for example, all three teams were open to a version of term limits for Supreme Court justices. So struck by this agreement, we suggested that all three teams convene together in a virtual convention. And uh, with the leadership of um, all three team members and uh, uh, Elon Worman, who made a list of the areas that he thought were most ripe for agreement, the teams met. And over the summer, uh, on the historic uh, day in uh, August uh, that began the convention, um, in, in the space of two Zoom meetings and some further email exchanges, all three teams have now proposed five amendments to the constitution. And as uh, a, an observer, a silent observer and uh, 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 one of the many secretaries to the convention, I was struck by the extraordinary high quality of deliberations. Indeed, I felt like I was watching modern day founders uh, to see the seriousness and sense of purpose with which the three teams were able very quickly to agree on language, to compromise, and to present five amendments. Uh, it was an inspiring testament to the possibility of constitutional consensus in this polarized age. So we're here to present to you the results of the convention and to send them into the world to see uh, what their fate may be. Um, and now I'm just gonna jump right in and uh, begin with you, Elon Worman, uh, head of Team Conservative. You were, as I said, in a sense, the, the James Madison of the convention because you made an initial list of possible areas of agreement. What uh, struck you about the deliberations and what would you like our friends to know about the amendments that emerged? Sure, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, Jeff Rosen and the National Constitution Center for impaneling uh, these teams and spending the time and energy on us. Uh, we were all pretty skeptical that we would be able to come to some kind of agreement. And I think we are all pretty much, I don't know, shocked, surprised, mm -hmm. pleasantly surprised that we were able to come to this agreement. One thing that is obvious sort of from the get-go, I'm not sure we posted uh, the amendments online just yet. I think they're coming online today. We do have them here and we're gonna walk you through them. Presidential eligibility, legislative veto, impeachments, appointments and confirmations, and future amendments. These are all structural provisions of the constitution. Of course, libertarians, progressive, conservatives, everyone has their sort of preferred set of rights that they like, rights that they would maybe prefer to enshrine in the constitution, that they would want to insulate from democratic control, from democratic politics. But we have a sort of a different set. I mean, there's a large shared agreement about fundamental rights, but there's also a different set. Uh, but what we could agree on is structural reforms, sort of these good government reforms to make government work better, to better secure the liberties that are already guaranteed in the Constitution, to better uh, the democratic lawmaking process itself. And so it's not surprising, perhaps, that it was the struct these structural provisions that we could agree to sort of behind this veil of ignorance. If you don't know who's in charge in four years or in 12 years, your political party or someone else's political party, are these amendments you could still stand behind? Uh, and those are the five sets that we were able to agree on. Thank you so much for that and for your services to the convention. Carolyn Fredrickson, head of Team Progressive. Uh, Team Progressive in its proposed amendments uh, had a broad set of uh, proposals that would have made it easier to amend the constitution and would have made the constitution more democratic. Some of those found their way into the 
final version. Uh, what struck you about the final amendments? Do you, do you agree that it was structural reform that was an area of convergence? And what do you want our mm -hmm. friends to know about that? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to echo Elon in, in, in thanking you, Jeff, and the National Constitution Center for convening this great project. I, I, I um, um, also want to thank Elon, who, who, who just um, really did a great job in, in, in herding cats, uh, the proverbial herding of cats. Um, uh, and kept us on pace and kept us going with people with many other commitments. And, uh, and so, you know, chapeau, as they say in French, a hats off. Um, it was really, um, I'm really pleased that we're here and that, you know, we are here to be able to actually celebrate Constitution Day uh, with some amendments that we were able to come to via consensus. Um, I am surprised and pleased, um, but, but a couple of things I think. You would think that um, being able to have, you know, such a divergent set of people um, agree to amendments would mean that the amendments themselves would be pretty anodyne and pretty meaningless. And I actually think some of the things that we came to agree on are very significant. Um, and one of the areas I wanted to highlight was um, the, uh, the ability to amend the Constitution. We have a notoriously hard Constitution to amend. Um, the fact that there was a shared agreement that it needs to be easier was very significant. Uh, and as well as the agreement um, by the different teams that we needed to make it um, possible to change the composition of the Senate, which in the, in the Constitution as it now exists, many people don't know this, uh, you can't change the equal representation of states uh, in the Senate. Um, uh, through the Article Five Amendment process. So it's one of those things that is unchangeable, unamendable. Um, so I think that for me is really significant as well as the impeachment standard and, and some of the other provisions. But the fact that we were able to come together and form a consensus um, that the constitution really, well, a great and important document in American history is not perfect, uh, needs to be improved. And one way it needs to be improved is by making it easier to continue to improve it through the amendment process. That's a uh, wonderful way to uh, put it. Um, Ilya Shapiro, uh, in your initial proposed amendments, Team Libertarian had inserted uh, a single sentence after a lot of the textual parts of the Constitution, and we mean it. And we had uh, thought that that might make uh, Team Libertarian resistant to further change, and yet you joined the other teams in supporting these structural amendments. Were you surprised by the degree of consensus? Well, let's just be clear that by consensus, it doesn't mean every bit of the proposed amendment was unanimous. And indeed, in our various kind of micro votes, and we had parts, sub clauses, and <laughs> Uh, you know, Elon was not just the James Madison, but also George Washington as kind of presiding over the convention. And he took, due, you know, diligent notes of this. And we, we, the first thing we did at the convention, this is very interesting, perhaps. Uh, uh, the first thing we had to do was adopt voting rules. You know, what, what could be a proposed amendment among our three groups? And we decided uh, that uh, it had to be 6-3 with at least one member of each team. Uh, as part of, of that six. And so some proposals, some of the provisions were indeed, you know, seven, two or six, three or, or, or things like that. Um, and I should say, Carolyn left off by talking about the amendment, uh, 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 proposed amendment. Uh, in our proposed constitution, we actually were left that alone because we thought, well, if we're creating the perfect constitution, largely by taking the current one and saying, and we mean it, although we did make certain other tweaks, um, then why then am allowed to be amended after that? But since what we were going to be compromising on was not the perfect constitution, we said, okay, well, this one should be easier to amend. And we uh, specifically in our own proposal did not contemplate really good government proposals. We thought, okay, our charge is to create a libertarian constitution. Fine. These, you know, nibbling around the edges of uh, term limits or how many justices or these kind of technocratic things, we, we avoided that. And so we didn't have a counter proposal to those things when Elon was looking through of what there would be areas of agreement. But sure, for example, the Supreme Court term limits matched with fixing the set number that would that has the good government benefit of increasing public confidence in the court, even though it would not and we can discuss this uh, change kind of the political nature of things. In fact, it would enhance the role uh, the court plays in presidential elections. But we were pleased, certainly, that a couple of our proposals made it into the ultimate amendments 
uh, lowering the threshold for impeachment, allowing Congress to have a line item veto over executive actions, not a line item, a legislative veto over executive actions, uh, things like that. So not everything that was ultimately proposed was what we would consider to be mere good government things. There were substantive uh, areas of change. Um, thank you for that. Thanks for sharing the voting rules that you agreed on for reminding us that not all the amendments were unanimous. And indeed you, if, if uh, Elon was the George Washington and Madison and, and Carolyn was the Governor Morris, we were saying, because of her important uh, uh, functions on the Committee of Style, you were the, you threatened to be the George Mason at times because you you opposed some of the uh, amendments uh, that won by a six to three vote, but always in the spirit that you just identified of compromise. And that was the most striking thing about the deliberation that all three teams were willing to put aside their notion of uh, perfect uh, amendments in the interest of reaching consensus. And it, that's why you heard all of us express surprise and, and great um, delight that uh, these five amendments have emerged. Well, let's now walk through them. Um, and uh, folks who are uh, listening along with us can find them online, can find the text. But the first amendment has to do with presidential eligibility. This is amendment uh, 28. Uh, no person shall be eligible to the office of president except a person who has attained the age of 35 and been a citizen and resident in the United States for 14 years. This removes the natural born citizenship requirement. Elon, I think this amendment was not in your initial list. Tell us about how it emerged and how it passed. It, this was kind of like Article 3 of the current constitution, where at the very end of the summer, they're like, oh, shoot, we should provide for a judiciary. And there wasn't very much discussion actually about Article 3 in the convention. As we were nearing the end of our deliberations, we had initially five proposed amendments. Uh, we were deliberating on the last one, which did not obtain sufficient consensus. And so we were about to call it a day. And at that point, actually, one of the members of uh, Team Libertarian, Timothy Sandifer of the Goldwater Institute said, well, wait a minute, all three teams also agreed to get rid of natural born citizenship requirement for president. And we had slightly different uh, ways we handled this in our respective constitutions. For example, I think uh, the conservative, I think we just got rid of the natural born citizenship requirement without putting much more thought to it. But then Team Libertarian said, you have to have been 35 years a citizen. So at least 35 years, but old, but also 35 years a citizen. This struck, I think, Team Progressive as well. That's way too much time. You know, so it's if you move to the United States when you were 20, become a citizen, that's 35 years is, is unnecessarily long. And so we ended up settling on uh, if you are 14 years uh, a citizen resident in the United States, you can't have been um, you know, naturalized, I suppose. And, uh, or you couldn't have even been born in the United States. You can't be a natural born citizen for fewer than 14 years before you go off and live in France for the rest of your life. And you can't just come back and then run for president if you haven't been a resident citizen for 14 years. And so that's how we came to relatively quick agreement. This was absolutely the fastest uh, provision. And, and now this means that I'm eligible in, in another six years. So. <laughs> All right, anyway. well, we should go back and review that then. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, this is, that was the advantage of the initial libertarian yeah. proposal for 35 years a citizen is it would have kept <laughs> Ilya Shapiro <laughs> from being eligible for a much longer period of time. Ke Carolyn, thoughts on this consensus and tell our uh, friends, what the final amendment deliberation was that didn't pass when this one emerged? Well, so um, so this one was the easy one. It really was because we all we all recognize this is a very um, you know it it doesn't make any sense. Um, it's discriminatory, um, and it's keeping good people from running. And so so there really wasn't a lot of it was just around these these details. We had actually in, in the progressive constitution actually had lowered the age of running for president um, to 30. Um, so, you know, as we kind of, this really, I think was one, one of the amendments, they all were, had bits and pieces from the different um, constitutions, but this one was really a, uh, a, a really interesting process of taking a little bit from each one and putting it together and coming up with, I think a rational uh, approach to, you know, what, what should be the requirements for somebody to run for president. Now, where we didn't end up, um, uh, reaching consensus was on something that continues to be a, a major issue in, in, in American law and politics, which is, you know, how do we structure our congressional districts? Um, and we, you know, would really very much have liked on the progressive side to have seen um, independent redistricting commissions required um, as part of the, the, the process for constructing 
congressional districts so that there would be no massive manipulations by elected uh, officials protecting their own um, control of, of, the, uh, of the office. Um, and so we, we, we thought maybe we could get there, but we couldn't, we couldn't quite get that one over the line. There were just a few, there was in principle, team um, conservative and team progressive agreed that we should be you know, doing something about it, but the, the mechanisms weren't quite aligned. Whenever the conservatives and progressives agree, you know, watch your pocketbook. <laughs> well, that was the case here, Ilya, and, and Team Libertarian was the uh, squeaky wheel when it came to the redistricting amendment, as, as well as to um, electoral college reform, which was an initial area of agreement among the conservatives and progressives, and uh, but not the libertarians. But first, uh, tell us about uh, the agreement about the natural born citizen requirement and the uh, unanimous rejection of nativism that it represented, and then tell us about the disagreement about that redistricting amendment, which as initially proposed by uh, Elon would have said, each state shall pursue into legislation adopted in the year following the national consensus, allocate the state's representatives by drawing compact and contiguous districts of as nearly equal number of citizens as is feasible, provided that Congress may by a vote of three fifths of both houses authorize other equitable methods of alloc allocation. So tell us about those, those two things. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it really just came about really quick when, when Tim Sandifer, as Elon said, realized that there was one area of agreement that we could that we come to and the, you know, we wanted to ensure that it wasn't, um, you know, some Manchurian candidate or something, but someone who actually had lived here for 14 years as a, as a citizen. Um, but uh, other than that, there was no, you know, Alexander Hamilton that anybody wanted to avoid, uh, you know, becoming president or nobody, I guess, had uh, antipathy to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger or anybody else or, or me for that matter. Um, so that, that just came about because it, um, you know, if someone's been here as a citizen for, for 14 years, then, then that's, uh, that's enough. Um, By the way, Ilya, if, if I may interject. There are many reasons that neither you nor Arnold Schwarzenegger should be president, but your foreign birth is not <laughs> among those reasons. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the uh, well, I mean, I couldn't even get elected to school board, so I don't, you know, I think for practical purposes, it was uh, right. It's uh, kind of a moot, a moot, a point. moot point, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, uh, on on the redistricting, yeah, uh, or electoral college reform, uh, we just thought that those are you know technocratic changes that are uh, in search of a problem. Because at the end of the day, uh, the argument is that there's too much politics and the people can't govern themselves. We need these experts. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's turtles all the way down. It's politics all the way down at a certain point. We can't just have a parchment barrier. We know in in current times, independent districting commissions get captured by one interest or another. Uh, if you really want to, you know, address the issue of, of large states being underrepresented, and this is not a, a red or blue issue, you know, if you look at the 10 smallest states, I think half are blue, half are red, but uh, if, if, if that's your concern, then, then my technocratic solution has always been to expand the House by some multiple, to, that would also prevent uh, House gerrymanders, it would increase the electoral votes of larger states, etc. But anyway, uh, uh, that, that we felt just was not... Uh, something that was uh, that was indicated. Thank you well, for that. We you... could always go back and revisit the size of the house because I don't think that was one that we even had enough time to discuss, but I don't think we team progressive would necessarily have any problems with that. And, and of course, nothing prevents Congress from changing, I think, the size of the house today. It's just whether we compel right. Them. It hasn't since like 1921 because it used to, as the population grew, it would, it would increase, but then it's been, it's been fixed. W one thing that's striking, you can hear from the uh, quality of the debate among our uh, delegates. It, it's the fact that all of them are so deeply uh, immersed in constitutional history and uh, learned and, and scholarly, I think that allowed them to converge so quickly because they were an extremely remarkably well-informed set of delegates and they thought deeply about these questions. Um, well, now let's uh, present and propose the remaining four amendments to the constitution uh, so that we, the people of the United States, can deliberate about them and consider them. Okay. Amendment 29 has to do with the legislative veto. Congress may, by law, provide for a veto by majority votes in each of the houses of Congress of actions taken by the executive department, except actions adjudicating the applicability of a statute or regulation to a person. A failure by Congress to act pursuant to such a law shall not affect any judicial determination as to whether any law 
or any actions of the executive department are valid or enforceable. Alon Warman, tell us about the legislative veto amendment. So some of you, some of the several hundred listening online, I'm sure are law students or uh, lawyers have surely heard of the case INS v. Chadha. This is a case, so historically, the Congress legislated with more specificity. It also did less, but as the country grew, as the national economy grew, as federal intervention grew, there was only so much Congress felt that it could do, and it ended up delegating a lot of discretion, a lot of power to the executive. So today we have a much larger administrative state. And part of this initial deal, uh, arguably, was Congress in the statutes delegating broad authority to the executive often reserved what was called a legislative veto. So did we delegate authority to the president and the administration to execute the law in X, Y, and Z manner? But once you act pursuant to this statute, you must submit your action to Congress. And if the statute provided a legislative veto, Congress could then veto the executive decision. So in INS, uh, in INS v. Chadha, the Supreme Court struck this down as violating the separation of powers. Uh, the Immigration and National Act, Nationality Act delegated authority to the Attorney General to withhold removal under certain conditions for an, uh, an illegal alien who uh, otherwise was deportable but met certain conditions to be allowed to stay in the country. The Attorney General decided that Jagdish Chada should stay in the United States. He met these criteria. It was submitted to the House of Representatives pursuant to a so-called legislative veto provision. And the House, without really any discussion, any vote on the word of the chairman of the subcommittee, vetoed the decision to withhold the deportation, thereby forcing Jagdish Dog Chada to be removed from the United States. This almost certainly is unconstitutional under uh, the current constitution. Why? Because Congress can only make law if it wants to change the discretion that it delegated to the president, it has to pass a new law, limiting that discretion in the future. How does it pass a law? You need two houses of Congress to agree to a text, and you need the president to sign that text. Where in the Constitution does Congress get to alter legal relations through vetoing the act of an executive? It, it almost certainly was a correct decision. Our amendment here overturns the general result of, or the general reasoning of INS Vichada, but not actually the result of INS Vichada. We permit in this a Congress to enact a two house legislative veto, the rationale being in the modern world with broad delegations to the executive, the executive is often engaged in policymaking and it is consistent with separation of powers principle to give Congress a say, a back end check on the legislative like power. I'm not gonna say the legislative power, but legislative like power that it gives to executive. When the executive makes a rulemaking, it should get the agreement of both Congress uh, as well as the president. And this veto allows them this back end check. Uh, the administration keeps on going, but Congress could always step in uh, and veto determination. But what Congress can't veto is any action adjudicating the applicability of a statute or regulation to a person. We did not want Congress to look like it was enacting ex post facto laws or bills of attainder where it singled out individuals uh, for particular treatment. So the case of INS v. Chata involved the applicability of a statute to a, a person. That result in that case would be the same. Congress could not give itself a power to veto individual immigration decisions, for example. But this authorizes Congress more generally to enact a two house legislative uh, veto provision in the future. Thank, thank you for all that. Uh, Carolyn, um, Elon talked about delegations to the administrative state, which sounds like a more conservative concern, and yet progressives signed on to this amendment. And indeed, progressives like conservatives have expressed concern about unilateral executive action from objections to President Trump building the wall to objections to President Obama protecting the dreamers. So, you know, tell our friends why it was the team progressive thought it was important to have a legislative veto. Sure. And we, we did have a, a proposal in our uh, uh, progressive constitution that would have provided for a, uh, a legislative veto, as you, as you mentioned. And part of that is because we do believe that Congress has the power to delegate to executive agencies um, the uh, ability to fill out the contours of statutes, for example, like the Clean Air Act uh, or other statutes where Congress has anticipated that the agencies would do quite a, a, a lot of the work, the expertise that they have. But that also entails recognizing that Congress is the lawmaking authority. And if there are particular actions uh, that are um, uh, taken by the executive agencies, there should be an ability uh, for Congress to review that. Uh, and the history was before Chadha that Congress had regularly put in statutes 
um, the ability to have that kind of a legislative veto. And it was exercised sporadically. Um, and so what we preferred and what we like about this, this version is it's not a kind of a radical approach, which is a requirement of review of executive action every time there's new rulemaking, uh, expedited process like the Congressional Review Act, but is actually is good governance. We actually think that the Constitution should include um, good governance because it is about governance. And this is a provision that seems to comport with that very much. Fascinating. Um, Ilya, there's a, a final sentence that says, the failure by Congress to act pursuant to this law shall not affect any judicial determination as to whether any law or action of the executive department are valid or enforceable. Uh, that allows the court still to hold that particular delegations are unconstitutional. Uh, was that important to libertarians and why did libertarians support the legislative veto? That was absolutely important because there are, depending on how you use legislative history, there are canons of statutory interpretation that say if Congress acts or doesn't act or you know, it's proposed here, uh, that uh, can lead a court to infer that uh, Congress approves to some such extent or at least doesn't disapprove of, of a given action. So that um, sentence, which is a, a guide to the judiciary about what congressional uh, inaction or, or decision not to use the legislative veto means in any uh, given case. Uh, and we would have, uh, to use Caroline's uh, terms, preferred a more radical version where certainly at least major rules and regulations would have to be uh, approved by Congress. But uh, uh, this was certainly moving the ball along. And I think even on progressive terms, and I have to commend Caroline, I think, for, for recognizing this, uh, if you care about uh, democracy and, and you know, accountability to, to, to the people's representatives, then you want uh, Congress to have more of a say over these things. Uh, rather than, um, you know, this is perhaps when some progressive values are intention, um, having the rule by the experts uh, in the agencies. Uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson, the father of, of modern American progressivism, uh, you know, liked that German method of having the, the agency. You know, we know what the best way of administering, I don't know, food regulation is. And so we'll just let the experts do that. We don't need the, the dirty work of, of, of Congress. But I think in this age, certainly of the ever growing imperial presidency and governance by the pen and phone and tweet, uh, it's, it's good to give Congress more power back to rebalance separation of powers. And at least, uh, you know, we would have preferred it to be enshrined constitutionally rather than giving uh, Congress a legislative option to create for itself uh, a veto. Uh, it's good to give Congress that power to, to, to curb the executive as necessary. Wonderful. Well, our next amendment is Amendment 30 to do with impeachment. It's long, so I won't uh, read the whole thing. And I will uh, note that it makes it harder for the House to impeach, but easier for the Senate to convict. Elon, tell us more about what the impeachment amendment does. Sure, uh, and I'll let the others chime in here because there really was a lot of collaboration mm -hmm. on figuring out the components of the impeachment amendment. I do think, unless I'm mistaken, that this took up more deliberation than any other of the amendments. Though actually it was a pretty narrow mm -hmm. question that took up mm -hmm. most of the deliberation, at least the contentious deliberation. It's also because it was the first one we took up and I think we all just had more energy and <laughs> <laughs> yes. willingness to fight. Maybe. <laughs> no, but I did, there was a lot more of, there. well, it's long too. So there are a lot of different to and there were things that came up, which is like, okay, what about if the president or office holder had just left office? Are they impeachable then? Mm -hmm. We decided yes, up to six months and conviction must be within a year for former office holders. So the most important reform here is again, making it harder to impeach, but easier to convict by raising the majority vote threshold currently that exists for house impeachment to three fifths and lowering the conviction, conviction threshold in the Senate, which is two thirds, also down to three fifths. So three fifths of the magic number three-fifths to impeach and three-fifths to convict. Why is this important? We think there must be some bipartisan buy-in to start an impeachment, but the two-thirds threshold makes it truly difficult to convict even genuinely malfeasant presidents. And so we think that this three-fifths, three-fifths compromise is the most essential. And I will then just say, and I'll leave to the others to flush out the details, we, uh, the standard is clarified. High crimes and misdemeanors, we say, uh, that, that, that these officers, president, vice president, shall be subject to impeachment for serious criminal acts or for serious abuse of the public trust. 
from team conservatives perspective anyway, and maybe from the others, this merely clarifies the high crimes and misdemeanor standard. No, it doesn't actually have to be a crime or a misdemeanor under the law. It can be a political crime, if you will, a political offense and abuse of public trust. We think that's consistent with the current standard and it merely clarifies it. The key debate that we had was over, uh, especially, um, actually, I think both Caroline and Ilya were on the side here of making it even easier of a standard to meet for impeachment, whether removing the word serious from criminal acts and abuse of the public trust or adding a grounds for impeachment. We had that whole debate over synonyms for serious so as not to use it twice in the same sentence. Well, the, you know, we also had a committee of style and the question was, can you say for serious criminal acts or abuse of the public trust? Does serious modify only criminal acts or abuse of the public trust? Now, there was an argument here for strategic ambiguity. Why? Because certain members to my right, mm -hmm. wanted uh, it to be any abuse of the public trust, wanted it to be a lower standard. Well, if I could say, and, 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 and it's really a reflection of the fact that, and this is, I think, an area we agree, right? That impeachment is a political process. And therefore, yes. the abuse of the public trust, if it's serious or if it's not, I mean, it, it's going to be, Congress initiates a, an impeachment proceeding based on the, the determination that there has been an abuse of the public trust. Putting the word serious in there didn't seem to us to do a lot of work. Um, it might make people feel better, but I, you know, I think generally uh, that impeachments are broad because of, you know, at least the perception that the that the abuse of the public trust is um, is a serious one. But I, I would say that when we were very much in agreement with with uh, with with both teams um, was that the I think this is true also of the libertarians that that frankly abuse of the public trust is what we understand already to be part of high crimes and misdemeanors, and that uh, it is really a helpful clarification. There was a lot of muddying of the waters during, let's just say, the past two impeachment procedures that um, were held that um, about whether something actually had to be technically a crime or not. And some of us thought maybe there were actually even crimes involved, but nonetheless, that didn't have to be part of it. And it's historically, and as a matter of constitutional understandings, even prior to our constitution, high crimes and misdemeanors had been understood in a much more broad sense. Um, but the, the amendment that we, we drafted, and we did spend a lot of time, we spent a lot of time on the word serious. Um, and we spent a lot of time talking about ability to do the job, basically what happens if, a, if someone becomes incapacitated. And is that something that we should have been addressing in impeachment? Um, some of you are aware of the 25th amendment that allows the cabinet to have some role in removal of the president. Uh, if there is an understanding of incapacity, but we really, we really had a lot of debate over whether Congress should have some ability to intervene because at least there was the question raised about whether the, the cabinet would be um, uh, implicated, would, would be un, unwilling to, 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 to go uh, uh, in a different direction from say the base of their party or do something that's politically problematic um, in order to prevent a, a president who's incapacitated from remaining in office. And we just couldn't resolve that one. So that will remain to come back to. I mean, there were some people who thought the 25th Amendment was just fine. And can I actually, before we jump to Ilya, just defend the ultimate result here uh, is we're going to get to this next uh, in the uh, Appointments and Confirmation Amendment. We do provide for a mechanism within the judiciary for the judiciary branch to remove judges for inability and incapacity. Notice the structural parallels now, if of course this is adopted, which it should be. The 25th Amendment allows the executive department through the vice president and the cabinet and through this a process that involves cabinet, but the executive department to police itself the judicial department under our proposal will be able to police itself when it comes to incapacity and inability. Okay? And by the way, this is not just a moot point. Very early on in 1790, 1791, turns out there was a senile federal district court judge in New Hampshire. And the question is, what do you, what do, you do? They have lifetime tenure, you can't remove them. And they came up with a way to just give these unimportant cases to that judge and they reassigned, it, it was weird. So we wanted a mechanism. And Congress of course can expel its own members and can be the judges of the qualifications of its own members. There was sufficient agreement, uh, at least among the three teams uh, that that process allowing each branch to sort of police inability and incapacity among its own members was the most structurally 
sound. They can, right. they can, they're the best guarantors of the integrity and the reputation. I, I, sort I of don't of know that we agreed on that, Elon, yeah. actually. I think we just couldn't, I mean, from our perspective, we just couldn't get agreement on the Right, there, there, there was no agreement to give Congress I think, a say over the president. Because I, I think the disagreement we have right. is, at least from our perspective, is that uh, where the, the members of the cabinet are appointed by the president, chosen by the president the judiciary doesn't function that way so it's it's not quite comparable so we would have still um, been interested in, in and it wasn't yeah, in, because in we fact, thought it was a structurally better approach. i think one of my teammates ended up voting against the whole amendment mm -hmm. uh because he couldn't get that provision about uh addressing uh executive incapacity mm -hmm. you let me ask you to uh give team libertarian's perspective on this debate and several of the provisions were unanimous including those that would have uh, increased the voting threshold to three fifths and lowered the conviction threshold to three fifths and given Congress a subpoena power, but two of them were not. And you were uh, in dissent on some of them, uh, including the one clarifying the impeachment standard and also uh, permitting uh, convicted office holders uh, from not holding federal and state office, which gave rise to a fascinating debate about whether it would blow off steam to allow convicted officials to hold state office. Um, but tell us, Ilya, um, what it was that uh, led to the disagreement and, and, and why ultimately you your team supported the amendment. Right. Um, well, this was a case where, uh, to paraphrase John Kerry, I voted against it before I voted for it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the impeachment standard uh, uh, in our proposed uh, Team Libertarians Constitution was uh, just unfit for office. However, the Senate or any individual senator wants to define unfit, it's a political judgment and impeachment inherently is, they should be able to, to vote based on that, whether that means physical incapacity, whether it means someone who's breached the public trust, committed a crime, just you know, incompetent, what, what, how, whatever case you wanna make that you then have to take to the people to justify, uh, we thought that was enough. And, and this you know, serious abuse of the public trust, so just milk toast abuses of the public trust are okay? I mean, we didn't think so. Uh, and that's why I, I, I voted against uh, that phrasing, although ultimately uh, I voted for the, the, the amendment as a whole because it does move the ball in a, in a positive direction from from my perspective or, or, or our perspective. Um, the, you know, the, I, I think I'll leave it there. Yeah. Great, well, let's turn to our next. Oh, can uh, I say one, just to know sure. how, how nitpicky we were about things. We did make kind of these two clarifications. There's a question, at least, I don't know how many people believe this, of whether officers of the United States refers just to, pre refers just to appointed mm -hmm. officers, like Secretary of State, whether that covers president or vice president. Under the current constitution, you can impeach a president who's then disqualified from holding an office under the United States. And so there's a question of whether that covers future president or vice president. We clarified that. And under the current constitution, the chief justice presides when the president is tried, but not when the vice president is tried, right? The president of the Senate is the presiding officer. Well, the vice president is the president of the Senate raising this possibility that if the vice president is impeached, the vice president will preside over his or her own impeachment. We clarify all these little things about what our officer is. What our, so we, we took this very seriously. That's we also fixed the punctuation and the uh, overcapitalization. I don't know whether that was a Germanic influence in the original drafting of Committee of Style, but uh, yeah, it reads better. Just shows you that originalism really can't explain a lot of things. So I need to <laughs> do some additional work. Excellent. Which we're doing right here. Excellent. Uh, well, Amendment uh, 31 has to do with appointments. Again, it's uh, it's it's uh, not short and it's uh, carefully um, drafted. But the first section uh, says that the president shall have power with the Senate to make treaties, provided that three fifths of the senators concur. And will it has to do with nominations. It um, makes the nominations amendment is significant because it says that nominations shall be deemed to have received the advice and consent of the Senate unless disapproved by majority vote within three months of the nomination. But any senator shall have the right to bring any nomination to the floor for debate and vote prior to that time. And any, any nomination with, made within the last three months of the president's term shall lapse at the end of that term unless sooner approved by the Senate. And then section two is extremely important and has to do with uh, term limits for Supreme Court justices, which led to a very um, vigorous 
debate and you agreed on a term limits amendment. Elon, tell us about Amendment 31. Sure. So the easiest part of this amendment mm. is the treaty ratification process. <laughs> we're replacing the appointments clause, which includes the treaty ratification, and we're replacing sort of Article 3, Section 1, the judicial power. And so like, look, we're already doing this. Let's make it easier to ratify treaties. Currently, two thirds of the Senate have to concur, which is extraordinarily difficult. So what do we have? We have imperial presidency. We have executive agreements where executives make technically non-binding legal agreements of, of great importance that every four years or eight years when there's a new president, the new president can just abrogate uh, on his or her own. And we just thought, let's make it easier to make treaties, the law of the land that can't just change from uh, presidential regime to presidential regime. So that was the easiest part. Okay, the hard part. What do we do with the Supreme Court? There is a raging battle that uh, Caroline and other members of her team and other members of my team have been <laughs> involved in actually me too, because I provided testimony for you the Supreme did. Court Commission, yes. Michael McConnell, Robbie George, you, Jamal. So almost, so we have a lot of participants in the actual ongoing debate over how to reform the Supreme Court. So what does this amendment do? The, the, the compromise is we fix the number of Supreme Court justices at nine. So no possibility of court packing or changing the number, save a future constitutional amendment, but we impose 18 year staggered term limits. That's the deal. Right now, the conservatives, were, you know, we're happy. We have six, I'm not going to call them originalists because that would be contradicting what I said on Friday when I was here for that session. Uh, but, you know, a mix of conservative originalist judges, they can, stay all, they can stay as long as they want, right, from the conservative perspective. But there is something to lose here because court packing, although politically improbable, is not impossible and is likely to become more probable over time if there is discontent with the court. So there was some room to give there. And of course, uh, the uh, progressives uh, would have probably uh, preferred not fixing the Supreme Court uh, uh, justices at nine, but certainly they agree lifetime tenure is, is not a good idea. Uh, and so that was the compromise. We fix it at nine and we have 18 year staggered term limits. This is what we're, and I'm, I'm sure Caroline and Ilya are gonna have a lot more to say about this. So let me just say, how does this connect to confirmation? What's the point of 18 year staggered term limits? That every presidential term, there are two appointments. That's it. We know, like clockwork, there are going to be two appointments, reduces the temperature of presidential confirmation battles. But this means that the president's nominee has to pass, has to be approved, right? If you have a Republican Senate, but a Democratic president for four years, what's to stop uh, just a four-year vacancy? If, you know, two vacancies on the court, and then a, pre a Republican president gets elected, and then you have three, uh, according to this. Every two years, the nominee has to be approved. But we don't want to get rid of a senatorial check altogether. We think advice and consent is good. It has a salutary effect on pre presidential appointments, moderating effect on presidential appointments. So what was the solution? As Jeff said, we make confirmations automatic within three months. But the Senate, like a veto, it's another legislative veto actually, may within that three months vote down the nominee if they want or sooner approve the nominee. What does this mean? Merrick Garland may not have been approved, but he would have gotten a vote. And then if he had been disapproved, the president would have put someone else up who would have gotten another vote. And at some point, the cost, the political cost of disapproving of every nominee to the Supreme Court would be politically catastrophic for the party doing it, because that's the deal that we're doing here every two years. And so that's how the confirmation process goes hand in hand with Supreme Court reform. Thank you for that. Carolyn, this was a remarkable debate to hear. There are many moving parts of this amendment. Team Progressive did make some compromises and, and also uh, converged around the final version. Tell us about it. Well, we, we did make some compromises. Um, uh, and uh, clearly, um, the, the current constitution does not set the size of the Supreme Court. Um, we believe it's better to allow it to grow, actually, um, even outside of the current debate about what's going on with the Supreme Court. Um, and simply, that's a reflection of the fact that our Supreme Court is very small relative to other countries' um, highest court. And so it's anomalous to have it um, uh, have so few members deal with such major questions that affect so many areas of our lives and be so unrepresentative. And so for us, having a larger court, again, even outside of the current um, debate uh, and discussion about some of the um, concerns with the Supreme Court, it is important. However, um, there were two parts to this. We also um, believe that term limits are good government. Um, you know, I know um, Ilya doesn't think that's a particularly appropriate thing for a constitution. I think that's what a constitution is about. It's about our government and, and our governance. 
And uh, we have, it's completely anomalous in the world, uh, except for a very few uh, hands, probably you could count them on one hand, countries that have um, a, a life tenure for their uh, highest court. Uh, even in the United States, I think it's only the state of Rhode Island uh, that has life tenure. This is not a prevailing model for a lot of reasons. It just doesn't make any sense to have somebody be able to be um, in the kind of position, especially with the way judicial review works in the United States and the immense power that the Supreme Court has to determine the direction of our lives for um, now for, for generations. Uh, and so for us, it makes a lot of sense. We did have a proposal for term limits. It was quite similar um, uh, with the idea of 18 year uh, terms. Uh, every president gets two appointments. Uh, and I think the mechanism that we came to, um, which is basically a constitutional abolition of the filibuster for, um, for nominations. And you know, you all, I'm sure, aware that that by its own rules, the Senate has uh, limited uh, filibusters with respect to Supreme Court and lower court nominations. Um, but this would ensure that they couldn't restore it because they can always put the rules back uh, if they would like to. So this makes sure that there will actually be a process of moving forward within the three months. They can approve or disapprove. Um, and the other reason why we decided that we would agree with this, despite the fact that it sets the court at nine, uh, is that we fix the, um, or at least we address to some extent, the a, a process of amending the constitution. And therefore, for us, this is something that could be revisited through another constitutional amendment now that it's easier uh, to amend the constitution. Thanks for that. Uh, Ilya, according to this article, after the article is ratified, the senior most judge currently serving on the Supreme Court, calculated by time served on the court, shall retire by the next presidential inauguration. Uh, I guess that would be Justice Thomas, if that were to pass. Uh, um, tell us why the libertarians thought that it was okay to uh, have the senior most justices retire and why you were able to converge on this 18 year term limits. Well, uh, if you didn't start or, or enshrine uh, retirements, then you would have for the current justices, they would leave as they would leave otherwise or they would die. And so you wouldn't uh, start the, uh, have a full complement of term limited justices until some haphazard time in the future. Now, some academics have proposed a system where this would happen. And for a period, you might have even up to, I don't know, 17 justices while everyone's not fully retired or one goes down or what, I mean, it, it would be very, it's, it's chaotic. So for practical purposes now, you know, whether it has to be before the next inauguration day or five years down the line or nine years down, you know, whenever, whatever the ultimate political compromise uh, would be, um, you know, that, that, that can get worked out. I think that's, that, that's less important to contemplate, but to, to have this structure in place of 18 years, nine justices of vacancy every two years, and I, I you know, th that, that's, that's how you uh, implement it. And in, um, I have a whole chapter on the term limit debate in my book, uh, Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations in the Politics of America's Highest Court, uh, updated paperback just came out this year. So uh, the hardcover is still available for cheaper on Amazon, you know, as well as CDs and Audible and Kindle and all the rest of it. Um, but the, um, you know, it's, let's be clear that having term limits and, fit, you know, preventing court packing uh, will not somehow, you know, fix the politicization of the court or turn down the heat on our confirmation battles. Uh, in fact, as I said at the outset, this would make the court and, and nominations even more part of presidential and Senate campaigns, but it would eliminate arbitrary or politically timed retirements, morbid health watches over octogenarian justices, you know, appointments of, you know, 23 year olds so they could serve for 80 years and, and, and those sorts of things that detract from public confidence in the court as an institution. So I don't view this as a you know, if, if you're if you think the court is illegitimate because it's political or, you know, Republicans are all illegitimate or, or whatever, uh, this is not going to fix that. Uh, but uh, I think it's salutary to have people have more confidence in the court, uh, nor, by the way, do I uh, agree with Caroline's characterization of getting rid of the filibuster, because as Elon said, uh, it just calls for a vote every three months. And then if the president keeps uh, nominating radical nominees. Well, that's up to the people. Is it the Senate that's being uh, obstructionist by voting them down every three months, or is the president uh, nominating unrealistic people? That becomes part of this political dance that, uh, again, more politics. You can't avoid politics. 
as I learned in writing my book, even George Washington, the first president, had a nominee rejected for political reasons. So you can't avoid politics, but this at least regularizes uh, and makes clear the stakes uh, when we're talking about Supreme Court nominations. I say I, as I, I have to learn from you because I don't think I've ever done a program with you when you haven't pitched your book. <laughs> I have three books and a fourth one coming out. So if anybody wants to find them, they're on Amazon and everywhere and Kindle and. and uh, I have two uh, books. So there you go. <laughs> we're, we're delighted to. <laughs> I also have a Substack, Shapiro's Gavel. So. Um, can I just make. So, so one more point that this raised, this also applies to executive uh, appointments. So again, Trump deserved his cabinet swiftly in place, as did Biden. They both did. But this still preserves a senatorial check. Someone could always bring the, them to a vote and vote them down. But if they don't do that, then you can't just delay interminably after three months, they will be in, they and will I be do, in place. I just do want to um, add one more piece to um, what Ilya was saying, or perhaps not add, but subtract, um, which is to say, I think there is a very big difference between uh, uh, the ability to vote down a, a nominee and the yeah. ability to, to obstruct endlessly. Because you know, I spent 10 years in the Senate and I know what a filibuster looks like, and it looks like nothing. Because if you look at the Senate floor, nothing is happening. Nobody has to own up to it. It's just an objection. Nothing happens. Nothing goes forward. If they actually have to vote and vote down, then they're accountable. Wonderful. Well, we have one last amendment to discuss, and it has to deal with future amendments. It makes it easier to amend the Constitution. Um, but just by a bit uh, broadly, uh, the current system requires two thirds votes to trigger a convention or a proposal and three quarters to ratify. And this amendment would have a three-fifths vote to propose and a two-thirds to ratify. Remember, friends, I had to do the math um, because it appears so frequently here, three-fifths is 60%, two-thirds is 66%. So it's not a complete transformation, but it is a bit easier. Um, Elon, tell us about the future amendments amendment. That's the reality of the situation is if you have a really hard constitution to amend, then judges are going to do more updating through judicial opinions, which we don't necessarily want. And to be clear, both on the right and the left, this would happen, whether through an open living constitutionalist system that the progressives have generally advocated over the last several decades, or a faux kind of originalism in which judges sort of update it through uh, you know, capacious, more capacious terms in the constitution or just bad originalism. It's just human nature. You're going to want to bring it up to speed based on your sort of modern day predilections and, and preferences. And it would just be better to be able to amend the constitution more often. James Madison said in a famous Federalist paper, this is sort of responding to this Jeffersonian argument, you know, that the earth belongs to the living. Every 19 years, we should have a new, have a new constitutional convention. And James Madison said, no, stability is important to bestow veneration on the constitution, right? And so he thought that we should not have too frequent amendments. And he's largely right about that because we want stability, we want veneration, we don't want a constitutional revolution too often, but it shouldn't be too hard to amend. Because if it's too hard, it's like a, a Laffer curve. Do people still know what a Laffer curve is like in economics, like the, the ideal tax rate to make the most amount of money. If you're below it, you're just not making as much as you could. But if you go above it, people hide their money. And so you're also not making as much as you could. There's just an ideal amendment process. We don't know whether we've reached it, but you don't want it too easy and you don't want it too hard. I suspect most people agree that the current system is a bit too hard. Uh, and so we're making it just slightly easier. I will say in one respect, this project, if it succeeds, if these four amendments, sans the future amendments are enacted, it sort of actually takes the winds out of the sail of the, making the amendment process easier. Uh, but nevertheless, I don't think a situation like, you know, I mean, look, it's not like it's that probable that this will be enacted, though I, ho I hope it has a non-zero chance, which is really all <laughs> we can hope for. Um, but so overall, again, we're trying to get closer to that point uh, that, that of maximization in terms of vener veneration and stability. Carolyn, whether you call it a Laffer curve or a Goldilocks standard or Madisonian deliberation, there is a, uh, this is a moderate amendment. Uh, it doesn't meet the desire of some progressives that the constitution be much easier to amend, uh, but it does make it a bit easier. And it also allows for states representing uh, 
two thirds of the population. Three quarters. Three quarters, I think we said. I'm reading a majority of the several states or by states representing two thirds of the population, according to the latest national census, shall propose amendments to the constitution. Uh, um, but three quarters to ratify. But three quarters to ratify. Yeah, okay. let, let's, let's read it because this is important. And this was part of the deliberation. It says uh, that on application of the legislatures of two thirds of the states or of states representing three quarters of the population, there's a general convention. So it was three quarters to call a convention and two thirds of the population to um, pr uh, propose an amendment in Congress. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, t t this is pretty technical parsing. <laughs> Tell us about the different uh, ratios about and, and, and the significance of allowing states that represent a certain proportion of the population mm -hmm. to act. Well, and this, this, does, this also took a, a while to hammer out. Um, but for us, it was really important that uh, a small minority of the of the public couldn't thwart um, a broadly supported amendment to the Constitution. And therefore, we want to make sure that there was a population uh, aspect to it as well as a states. I mean, we all of you are aware, I'm sure, of the Electoral College and how um, in so many of our recent elections, the person who won the popular vote has not actually become the president. Um, and so this is a similar kind of idea that we, we want to make sure that there is a, a, a broader engagement and a broader um, ability for uh, the population of the United States to amend our constitution and not have um, this uh, small minority of states um, that is getting excessive amount of representation uh, to thwart what we all want and see as so important for the future of our country. So that was really important to us. Um, this wasn't, you know, a perfect amendment by any means for us. We would have made it easier, um, but you know, again, in the spirit of compromise, our, as I said earlier, our constitution now is it's not impossible to amend, but it, let's say it's more than zero. You have more than zero percentage of amending our constitution, so that's where we stand right now with these proposed amendments. But it's not that much higher. And so we did recognize that this is a very important reform to our constitution to bring it at least sort of limping into the modern era. And we have three tiers, by the way. So mm -hmm. now I've reread re this, which is good. Uh, to ratify, you need two thirds of the states or three quarters of, or, or states representing three quarters of the population. Or if you're changing the composition of the Senate, three quarters of the states qua states. So there are three sort of tiers uh, of amendments. Just for clarification. Well, Ilya, final word on the future amendments amendment, and then we'll have brief closing thoughts. Um, you, you, again, libertarians were initially, we mean it, and you did agree to this modest uh, amendment, making it easier to amend and also allowing the unamendability of the Senate to be reconsidered. Tell us why you agree. Well, with the this particular provision and also uh, with the idea of an Article 5 constitutional convention more broadly, uh, I've never been afraid of uh, runaway conventions or, you know, amendments that are proposed because ultimately they have to be ratified currently by three quarters of the states, here by two thirds of the states or three quarters uh, of the people. Um, you know, if, if those kind of metrics can be met, uh, to ratify something truly crazy, well, then we're past the point of no return anyway. <laughs> and uh, you know, with Justice Kavanaugh, I, I like to live on the sunny side, on the uh, the sunrise side of the mountain, uh, and, and hope that we are not past the point of no return. Thank you for that. Well, I, I think brief closing thoughts would be helpful. I'm struck, friends, first of all, by the extraordinary quality of this debate. And let's now just pause and uh, express uh, gratitude and wonder for the the rigor and Madisonian spirit of compromise that produced these important amendments as a civic symbol of the possibility of consensus and deliberation. It's it's hard to think of a of a more galvanizing project. At the same time, it, it took us an hour to walk through them. They're they're complicated. They're technical. They don't fit on the back of a bumper sticker. And <laughs> you, as a convention, will decide what to do next, what the next steps are. But now is the time for you to make the case to the American people for why these amendments should be ratified. So just brief a, a paragraph or two from each of you to uh, send us off into Constitution Week um, and the first statement from Milan. All I'll say about this is, I know it's just the National Constitution Center. I mean, it's pretty serious. We're not Congress, but when are you gonna get together serious libertarian, conservative, 
and progressive scholars under serious auspices, right, like the National Constitution Center, to deliberate about these structural reforms to the Constitution and propose amendments in, for which all three teams, not wasn't unanimous, but there was agreement among all three teams. That means a supermajority supported these and at least uh, some part of the libertarian team, some part of the conservative team, and some part of the progressive team had to, to do this. If I had you know, my perfect constitution, kind of like the libertarian constitution Ilya Shapiro was talking about, would I want the Senate to be amendment? No, I like the Senate. I think it's good. I think it promotes federalism. If you want to do stuff at the, you know, do it at the local level. California can do its crazy stuff and impose it on Californians, and Texas can do its crazy stuff and impose it on Texas. I think it's good. But is this proposal better than the current proposal where it's far too hard to amend generally, which leads to disrespect for the constitution? I'm happy with the current crop for the most part of Supreme Court justices. Would I be maybe more pleased with lifetime tenure and fixing the justices at nine or just leaving things alone and you know rolling the dice with future court packing? May maybe the point is behind a veil of ignorance, these are good reforms that people from all political perspectives uh, can agree to and agree is better than the relevant provisions in the current constitution. And that's all one could really hope for when talking about constitutional conventions and constitutional amendments. And so we really think these are worth serious study and consideration among Congress and the American people. Thank you so much for that. Carolyn Fredrickson, head of Team Progressive, why should we the people ratify these five amendments? Well, so I just wanna start by saying that the Team Progressive wrestled really a lot at the beginning of this project with how should we approach coming up with a progressive constitution? And we really thought a lot about starting from scratch. Um, but we came to this approach because we wanted something that was actually going to be relevant in the current conversation. We really, we could have written the perfect constitution for us. It would not have looked like the one that we eat, that even our progressive constitution, um, the, the final product that we came out, uh, came out with, uh, it would have been, um, uh, quite different, but we really wanted to actually engage in this process of deliberation and hopefully present something where there could be the prospect for change. Um, and so what I'd like to think um, is that the idea that, um, you know, I think we're all frustrated um, and upset by the polarization and bitterness in the United States right now in our politics. The idea that we could actually come together and produce some ideas with a broad consensus that are plausible amendments to our constitution makes me think that maybe we could get beyond this moment. We could still, and we will, still have our fundamental disagreements about the direction of this country. But if we can agree on some of these ideas for moving forward and improving our constitution, I think we owe it to our country to try. Because I'd like to see us back in the back or at some point in the future, in, in the world where we could just have debates about the best policy and not be stuck in our corners, unable to talk to each other at all. Really well said. Thank you very much for that. Ilya Shapiro, head of Team Libertarian, last word to you. Why should we the people ratify these five amendments? I'm for any reform in general that at least does no harm uh, and yet increases popular confidence in our system of government, in the uh, integrity of our systems, uh, in uh, trust in, in societal institutions. And we're at a moment of low social trust, uh, of declining confidence in institutions. And I think these amendments can help with all of that. Are they a panacea? Uh, no. Uh, are they, you know, everyone's, you know, best wish of how to reform even each of these areas? Not necessarily. Uh, but I think that um, if, if you move the ball in this direction on impeachment, on appointments, on the size and, 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 and uh, 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 length of, of court duties, uh, all these different things, the, the, the legislative uh, uh, veto, rebalancing separation of powers, I think that would uh, increase confidence uh, in, uh, in America. Um, you know, I, I did not agree to anything just for agreement's sake. I did not go into the Constitutional Convention, the Amendments Convention, with an eye to hold hands and sing kumbaya. Uh, but the fact that we uh, did agree on these things and that they're all, uh, I think, uh, objectively a, a positive step um, is, is a good thing. And uh, I'm grateful to Jeff and the National Constitution Center for empowering in that way the better angels of our nature. 
Better Angels is an excellent way to put it. And dear delegates, on behalf of the National Constitution Center, it is an honor to thank the three of you for your services to the Constitutional Convention and providing America with a model of what thoughtful Madisonian deliberation and compromise can look like. You have inspired all of us to meet the better angels of our nature. And I look forward to seeing the response of a grateful nation to these thoughtful proposed amendments to the Constitution. Please join me in thanking the delegates. Thank you.